So guys how are you what if Naruto was the fire dragon of change in Marvel movie? The war has been going on for nearly 5 years. It started when I was 16 and am nearly 21 now, the war hasn't stopped in its brutality, nor its pace, at this rate, the people my people are suffering through a battle of attrition, the enemy has no need for supplies, and they lack the yearning of sustenance, they need no food, no water, no weapons, no armor, only space for their endless reproduction of clones. This is not just extended to just the men and women under my command, brave men and women who will gladly lay their lives down for the sake of peace through understanding and not peace through a false reality. No, my dear friends, I am talking about the civilians whose lives have been so drastically affected by this tragedy. The tragedy of war. Say what you will of Kagaya, of Madara, of Abido, call them murderers, thieves, liars, but what they are is nothing short of efficient, why bother subjugating the wills of hundreds of thousands of iron-willed shinobi, when they can simply create expendable clones, whose only thought is the extermination of those willing to defy their masters. They are nothing if not ruthless. I remain unbroken, unconquered, uncontested, they want me to give in, to acquiesce to their demands, to concede victory to them, I will not and could not, not when the lives of the men, women and children who will lead us to a better future, lead us to prosperity are resting on my shoulders. I will not bow, I will not break, I will not give up. Invictus Spiritus. The elemental nations used to be a land full of beauty, of tranquility, and of an ever-promising future of peace. Now, it was wrought with naught but craters, dead bodies and the smell of soot and ash, six figures could be seen in the epicenter of the crater, one lone figure standing against five others, three of those being further back than two others. The closer look would prompt the figures to be shown more prominently, a glimmering shade of saffron and amber, his outfit seemed to have consisted of prominent obsidian markings encompassing his entire body in an intricate pattern, Magatama markings circled around his entire neck, while the emblem of a sun was emblazoned upon his right hand, while his left hand was cradling the other figure. whose body seemed to be deteriorating at an unordinary pace. Amnid Sasuke, don't you dare die on me you bastard. We've almost got the bitch, stay with me till we get her. The figure shouted at the body he was cradling, his face morphing into an expression of rage, sadness and undeniable grief. Sasu could only cough violently, splotches of blood pooling out his mouth with each cough, Naruto, you you need to end it, we're on our last legs you Miyabito Kakashi Sakura, his sentence was interrupted by another series of wrenching coughs, more blood pooling out, take my half, end this fucking bitch once and for all. With that, he lifted his left hand, the symbol of an obsidian crescent moon emblazoned proudly on his hand. But the quick application of chakra, Sasuke willed his powers granted to him by Hagoromo and his lineage onto the now named Naruto whose face was nearing tears. Looking down at his left hand and feeling a sharp pain in his eyes, Naruto could see the symbol that was present on Sasuke, now searing itself onto his left hand, hissing at the sudden pain, he could only grit his teeth, as his head was now being assaulted with memories that were not his own, signifying that they were Sasuke's, and he was passing on his skills and abilities onto him. The fucking bastard wanted to be a martyr, sucks to be him, but Naruto wasn't going to let that happen. Hirama, I need your chakra, just enough for Hagoromo Jijus mark he gave me, nobody's going to die on me, not anymore, Naruto sounded off to his lifetime companion, the nine-tailed beast, Kurama, known also as the Kyubi no Kitsune. Alright kid, but my chakra's running low too, Kagaya is one mean bitch, and by this rate, we'll only have enough for a few A-ranked and S-ranked abilities, that, or you can use what we've been studying for in preparation for this battle, Kurama's reply was sobering for Naruto, reminding him that the battle had been going on for an upwards of 80 hours, they were fighting for nearly 4 days now. And the woman was only showing the slightest bits of fatigue. Stupid goddess and stupid powers, it wasn't going well for them, but for her. This was just another day to her, Kami, he hated her. Dealing his companion's chakra seep through his, he placed his right hand the one emblazoned with the mark of an obsidian sun on Sasuke's chest, applying the healing properties granted to him by the mark, he could feel Sasuke's chest go from heaving to slow, steady breaths. No dying on me yet, you emo prick, ill use our powers to end this, once and for all, so, make sure you and the others prepare a welcoming party for me, yeah. He grinned at his best friend, his confidence being a front to his anxiousness. Whatever he did now, he could not show any ounce of hesitation or anxiety, he didn't have enough chakra to prolong the fight as long as he wanted, so he had to think of a plan, and think of one fast. Hirama warned me that we only have enough for a few abilities, either that or we can use that, I really hope it doesn't come down to it, but from the looks of the way this fight is going, I might have two Naruto grimaced, he hated these odds. However, and this time, an excited grin crossed his features, he faced worse odds and won, what was another to the list. 
teleporting Sasuke with a quick application of Horation, he had to thank Pops for that sometime soon, thank Kami for the transference of memories through a physical link, he sped towards Kagaya, powering up his cloak even further and disappearing in a blur. Hoping to catch her off guard during this transition, he created two more clones and sent them to approach her from below and above, with his fist reared back, he and his clones appeared instantaneously together. And both clones appeared with a Rasengan of differing elements, his clone above appeared with a lava release Rasengan, while the one below appeared with a magnet release Rasengan, and each one of them consecutively sent their abilities flying forward. Steam release. Erupting propulsion fist. The blonde rocketed his fist forward, just as his clone sent theirs forward, and an erupting explosion occurred the moment each technique hit, creating a blinding smokescreen which obscured all four figures. When the smoke cleared, Kagaya was seen further away, her cloak bearing the only signs of damage, with rips on the lower hems, while her right sleeve was completely torn off, her face was now an ugly one of rage, if Naruto wasn't so concerned with his chakra levels, he wolf laughed, however, he was glad that it worked and from the looks of it. She was tiring from the massive expenditure of chakra she was outputting in order to safely teleport away from all their attacks. It seems that she was more fatigued than he realized, okay, I can use this to my advantage, all I need to is eyes widening at her sudden disappearance, he could only gape at his missing appendage as it was sent careening off to the other side of the battlefield. Ah fuck. He screamed as the pain finally settled in at having his right arm completely ripped from the elbow downwards. What the fuck. He didn't expect her to have enough chakra to be able to reliably teleport to him and hit him with an ability without getting a scratch in herself, what sort of chakra recovery did she have? Damn, now he was down to one arm and his prospects of ending this fight without resorting to that were getting slimmer and slimmer. Barama, even with the chakra arm I can produce, the amount of chakra I'll need to maintain it through this entire fight isn't going to last in a fully fledged fight against her, I think we might have to resort to using it. Barama only grunted in acceptance, damn it kid, I warned you she was one mean bitch, you let your guard down for just one split second and she immediately capitalized on it, focus brat. All she needs is for you to have a lapse in attention and she can end this faster than your sex life took a turn for the better. Even when they were seriously losing blood in the fight, he cold help but get in a sarcastic quip. Very fucking funny fuzzbit, now, we've got enough chakra, right? We can't go on like this, not when Sasuke and the others are still here, we need to get them out first and foremost, and then well start preparing the seal. Alright kid, but remember, you need to make sure she doesn't know what you're up to otherwise she's going to do whatever it takes to disrupt it, you need to make sure that she does not, under any circumstance, attempt to disrupt the seal or your concentration on creating it, one wrong stroke, one wrong hand sign, and we can kiss our ass goodbye, Karama warned him. Making sure to emphasize what consequences could befall if he let his attention or Kagaya's attention wander for one split second. Yeah I know, you don't need to tell me twice, Naruto grimaced and created three clones, okay, I need you guys to start preparing the seal, clone 1, supply clone 2 with the ink needed to create it, clone 2, make sure the moment clone 1 begins to create the ink, you begin the process, clone 3, I need you to go over to Sasuke and the others and teleport them back to the others. This is going to need our full attention, and if we hesitate even once in this, we're done for, yeah I've got your orders. Off to it then. Clones 1 through 3 nodded in confirmation and headed out to their objectives, clones 1 and 2 headed further down the battlefield and began the arduous process of creating the seal, while clone 3 headed towards the others in order to teleport them back to the other allied shinobi. Naruto himself prepared for a battle of endurance with the progenitor of chakra herself and willed his chakra into his right arm to act as a temporary replacement to his now missing right arm. Okay fuzzbit, let's do it with Karama sounding off and a savage grin crossing both their features, he teleported towards her to engage her in close quarters combat, nothing pumped up the blood faster than a good old fist fight. The Gaia, aware that he was now fully engaged in the mincet of combat with her, prepared herself just as fast, catching a knife jab towards her throat and quickly sending out a jab of her own to his chest, which was blocked by his other arm. They were locked into a stalemate of sorts, each of their hands caught in one another, which was then interrupted by Naruto headbutting her nose too fast for her to see, causing her to falter in their contest of strength which allowed Naruto to send out a lightning fast kick to her outer thigh. Which ended up stinging her more than she should let it forcing her to let go and hop back to recuperate the stinging in her left leg. Not giving her a moment of rest, Naruto rocketed towards her and teleported behind her, his knee aimed towards the back of her neck, execution style, she ended up turning around and blocking it with her right hand, gripping onto his knee, but Naruto, without skipping a beat, performed a roundhouse kick, freeing his knee in the process, but was also stopped by Kagaya's hand. She then proceeded to send a fist towards his groin, which caused him to go wide-eyed and backflip out of harm's way. Harm him all she wants, he was not letting her near his babies. 
Knowing she caught him in a vulnerable position, she sped towards his exposed front, sending out two palm strikes which caught him dead center in the chest, causing him to cough spittle and sending him flying backwards. How me she can hit. I think I felt two of my ribs snap from that alone, as crazy as she is, she knows what she's doing, Naruto begrudgingly complimented her, although he never would admit it out loud, as he was sent flying towards the dirt, his body was aching, and he could feel both his and his partner's reserves were cutting dangerously low, almost hitting chakra exhaustion points of low. Whatever it was, he needed to keep going, at least until the seal was completed. Looking over, he saw the clone 3 completed his task and was doing his utmost best to distract Kagaya as he recovered, as annoying as his clones were, ironic, considering they were fragments of himself, the good thing was that they all shared one mental link, which allowed them to subconsciously understand when their creator was in mortal danger and would go to any lengths to prevent it. He was lucky to have been using this technique so extensively, as before, they could only withstand one blow before being dispelled, but now they could only be dispelled by running out of the chakra or by being hit by something that could kill them, so being stabbed in the heart, neck, anywhere vital was a definite dispel. Attempting to recover from his severe injury, he could feel clone 1 and 2 sounding off to him that the seal was now complete, now all that was required were the hand signs, but he cold let his clones do this, as they didn't have the chakra needed to perform it, much less sustain it during the entire hand sign sequence. Okay Kurama, the clones got the seal ready, and they're doing their best to keep Kagaya in the middle of it, you supply the chakra, I supply the hand signs, you ready for this buddy? It's now or never. Naruto echoed to his companion, the fire of resolve and determination burning brightly within him. This was it, this was the end game. Our goddamn ride I'm ready for this kid, this is going to take a while, so give me time to supply you with the necessary amount of chakra, don't fumble with your hand signs kid, we're nearing the end now, remember, we need her to be physically tethered to either the seal or the person performing it, otherwise the seal will only do half the job and prevent her from escaping but not prevent her from reincarnating, Kurama huffed, and he could feel his companion shift inside his mind, into a meditative pose, fists bumped together. Knowing his tenant was now doing his part, Naruto opted to complete his end of the bargain, starting off with monkey. Monkey, snake, tiger, rami, boar, ram, ox, rat, bird, dog, dragon, snake, hare, tiger, horse, dog, boar. Uzumaki hidden technique. Burial grounds for the eternal youth. Shouting out the name of his technique, he teleported to the mark he left on her hand during their stalemate and quickly sent both palms flying forward, both hitting their mark directly on her chest. If it weren't for the fact that I'm sealing her, it'd complement her chest size, Shus got a decent rack on her, wait, no. Bad thoughts. Terribly bad thoughts. Damn it Iro Jiraiya. Without meaning to, he ended up groping her chest, were it not for the severity of the situation, he was sure Kurama would be laughing to his face about it, and from the look on Kagaya's face, she was both horrified, embarrassed and wait, was that arousal he could see in her eyes. Ugh, talk about inconvenient timing. While Kagaya may have been caught off guard, she was more than ready to counter his surprise move with one of her own, and sent a projectile towards his heart, hitting its mark and exiting out the back. You may have gotten me with whatever it is Yao've done, but I have ensured Yao'll never see your friends ever again. All killing ash bones. Kagaya roared in anger, the ceiling finally taking place and allowing herself a moment of satisfaction at seeing the gaping hole in her son's descendant's chest. She may have lost this war, but she damn made sure these people lost their beacon. Naruto couldn't believe it, how could he be so stupid as to not restrain her from pulling away or pulling a last-ditch attempt at killing him? He could feel the aftermath of her technique slowly disintegrating him from the inside, his molecules deteriorating at an alarming rate, too fast for his regeneration to suffice. Kid. Stay with me kid. Just for a few seconds, let the seal take place, don't you dare die on me. He could hear Kurama roar inside his mind, but it seemed so distant, so far, he refused to relinquish his grasp on Kagaya however, allowing the seal to spread all over her body and causing both of them to glow a blinding white, her screams penetrating his ears. Not even a few moments later, he could feel her entire presence disappear and be gone, even Black Zetsu was gone, five years, five long years of war and strife, five years of never-ending conflict, of bloodshed, finally, it was done. It was over, at long last, Kagaya had been defeated. Never to reappear ever again, his technique ensured it, after all, he made sure to confine her spirit and subsequently, that of the Ten Tails and Black Zetsu within him, never to be let out nor resurrected ever again. However, Black Zetsu's presence may have disappeared, but Kagaya and the Ten Tails were far too powerful to simply have their spirits be willed away. Suffice to say, the Ten Tails was not happy, after millennia, he was finally freed. Only to be stuck once again within a container. He refused. 
Too long had he spent biding his time for freedom, slowly influencing the course of humanity to end in his release. Too long had he spent manipulating the world and its events to shift towards his liking. Too long. Too, too long. But the roar within Naruto's mindscape, the ten tails poured an incredible amount of its chakra outwards in an attempt to implode Naruto's body within. Naruto, however, would not let it, and he and Kurama both fought back, a contest of undisputable strength of will taking place within his dying body, one fought for the freedom to rampage and destroy the world they knew, while the others refused to let it happen. What they were unaware of however, was the fact that such a battle now showed visible signs in the physical world, Naruto's body was rapidly convulsing, twitching and writhing, as the constant outpour of energy within his spirit was too much for his physical body to handle. Without even realizing, the technique both he and Kurama performed overloaded with chakra on a large tear occurred right where Naruto was convulsing, and without a single ounce of resistance, his body was pulled within its depths, and a resounding explosion occurred the moment the rip closed, killing all life that was previously present. The war was over, but the rest of the world would only know misery for the next coming months, as signs of their hero pointed towards his brave sacrifice in an attempt to ensure that world peace would be ensured. Naruto Uzumaki to the elemental nations was dead and gone, the world cried that day, however, its tears would bring about a new era of peace and prosperity, just like he intended for it to be. Elsewhere, in an entirely different realm of existence. The beings sat upon their throne of clouds, their eyes taking in the sight of the multiple universes underneath their fingertips, the universes that they had created, that they had watched over, that they had nurtured and cared for. Suddenly, their attention was taken elsewhere, an anomaly. Strange, most fascinatingly so. But the simple snap of their fingers, the being brought the anomaly towards their plane of existence, curiosity brimming within the depths. It was a human. Hmm, not just any simple human, not by any stretch of the imagination, no, no, he was far more wasn't he. Looking down at the side of the convulsing individual, the being known to only a select few as the one above all stepped down from their throne, merely gliding over to the boy now within their planes. Curious, most curious indeed it seems to me that you and your companions seem to be struggling against a creature. No more than that, a titanic being of evil of pure malice interesting indeed, I shall lend a hand, it seems to me that you required. Kneeling over, the one above all simply pressed one finger, and within the blink of an eye, the body had stopped convulsing, his omnipotent power deeming it to halt in its endeavor. The one above all mused, quite an interesting one, aren't you? I see that you have faced many hardships, many tragedies, you have witnessed the rise and fall of civilization itself, and yet your spirit remains unbowed, your morals remain unbent, your will remains unbroken, I would like to see what you have in store for me young one, here, a gift from me to you, once again. He pressed his fingertips towards Naruto's sternum, a divine glow of light trailing from his fingertip into the blonde shinobu's body. I grant you all my power, you shall be my inheritor of sorts, hm no not inheritor, my heir, you shall be the one to watch over my multiverses, in the event that I grow tired of them, you shall watch them, nurture them, grow them, learn from them as they will from you, you shall be my sole champion, now, go, these worlds need you, my son yes the one above all smiled, it was strange. Calling this non-blood related human their son, especially because they could not procreate, they certainly could, but they found no interest in such trivial matters, to call someone their son, their sole heir, it felt satisfactory to them, strange as it seemed. You will not remember me, nor will you remember this conversation, however, I doubt you will remain satisfied with the lingering questions that may be burning once you arrive, so, I urge you to satisfy your curiosities, to satisfy your burning need to understand just how you came about here and why it occurred. For I know you will not stray from the path you have set yourself since your existence, you contain something I've never seen in any one being before, even with all that has occurred, you contain within you an uncontested, immovable and immeasurable will so strong that you shall never stray from the light regardless of circumstance, and it is me perplexed. And somehow it leaves me with this feeling of warmth of happiness, knowing that there exists a human like you, with that, the one above all sent him away, careening towards the universe they knew would provide the most interesting for their heir. Earth 616. Invictus Spiritus. The large brick mansion sat in the middle of a large open field, gated off by a fence, and surrounded by the thick expanse of mid-autumn trees, at the front of said fence, sat a large plaque, which read. Xavier Institute for Gifted Youngsters. With a large whoosh, the gate sprang open, and a turquoise convertible sped through them and skidded around the large stone fountain, and stopped inches away from the entrance. On the entrance step stood a rather bored-looking redeed clad in a simple pair of a green shirt, blue jeans and white shoes, her eyes were currently on the novel in front of her, as if the display shown just moments before did not interest her the slightest, and the driver behind the wheel stepped out and slammed the door to his car, walking towards her in a huff. He undid the top buttons of his dress shirt and ran a hand through his hair. I'm guessing the date went well then Warren. 
The young Redeed asked the now named Warren, a tall and short cut blonde, who sighed. This was Warren Kenneth Worthington III, also known by his mutant codename, Angel. I hated it, went as well as you could expect Jean, Warren replied, to the name Jean. The Redeed on the stairs was known as Jean Elaine Gray, known by her mutant codename, Marvel Girl. Did it go bad? She asked softly, putting her book down after seeing the distress on the teen's face. Warren made a face, not bad per se the first part was great, we had dinner, talked a lot, laughed, all of it, not once did I have to pretend interest or fake laugh, usually, I had to do a semblance of either, but with her it wasn't the case, that's like, never what happens with society girls, he sighed and looked dejectedly towards Jean, but as you know, all good things must come to an end. After the dinner, she snuck us into her parents' summer house, and wanted to go swimming swimming Jean. Jean made a face in realization, oh, that's not good, causing Warren to snort. Yeah, you were telling me, I ended up showing her my baddest freakazoid wings, then we made out in the pool wait no, he paused and looked down at his feet, instead I ended up running with the worst stomachache in my life, and ditched her standing there in her underwear. Jean made a look that just sucks. Warren could only agree. Before any of them could continue their conversation, a large streak of light took their attention, and before either one of them could react, it was sent rocketing towards the mansion. Oh, oh fuck. Warren, get the professor. I think it's about to hit the mansion. Jean screamed to Warren, who quickly dashed into the mansion screaming professor. We've got a situation on our hands. Okay Jean, this is just like all those exercises the professor made you do in the training room, except, it's real, and if you mess up, she could only gulp as the thoughts of her failure ran through her head. Flexing her mental muscles, she quickly held her hands out and attempted to telepathically stop the large meteor from making a crater of the school. She succeeded, somewhat. Instead of a blazing meteor that would not doubt make a crater of the mansion if it was flying at the speed it was, it was now considerably slowed down, although at this rate, it would still create a massive hole in the side of the mansion and cause a media circus to erupt. Jean was doing her best to slow the meteor down and praying to whoever was up there that Warren managed to get the professor's attention, otherwise they were all in for a bad treat. I'm on Warren anytime now. Jean was visibly sweating, her muscles tensing as she forced all of her telekinetic powers to force the meteor to slow down enough so that the professor can do the rest. Just before she thought all was lost, rescue came in the form of Warren quickly wheeling the professor outside, whose face was already set in a look of concentration, as his one hand was cradling his temple, while the other was working with Jean on stopping the meteor. Jean. We cannot hope to stop this meteor from destroying the mansion, the very least we can do is redirect it to the back of the school grounds. Align your powers with mine and we shall attempt to do that instead. Charles requested of her, causing Jean to merely nod in his direction and force the meteor to stray off course away from the school. Within the next few minutes, both telepaths were doing their absolute best in diverting the meteor, and they did, barely. With a resounding boom. The meteor just narrowly missed the roof of the institute, instead careening towards the backfield and landing with a resounding crash. Jean crumpled to the floor the moment the meteor landed in their backyard backyard, being a severe understatement whatever it was, it could certainly wait until after she regained breath. Say what you would, but Jean felt like she deserved a little bit of rest, after mostly slowing the descent of the meteor by herself, giving credit where credit was due, she allowed herself a mental pat on the back. After going through multiple breathing exercises to ensure that her body won't just collapse underneath her, she went around the mansion, finding it useless to go through the mansion when the source of all her effort was laying just outside in what may or may not potentially be a massive crater. Finally rounding the corner, she saw the rest of the team already there and could feel the emotions wafting off them, mostly nervousness and quite oddly enough, anticipation. What, did they expect a super cute female alien to be what was inside the source of the meteor? Jean snorted, as if, although, it won't be too far a stretch if those thoughts did end up being true as boys will be boys, especially at this age. She sighed, ugh, so much for asking Warren to go to the circus, maybe he'll still be up for it after all this is over. Lamenting over the fact that she missed the opportunity to ask one of the only boys she found attractive out, could you blame her? She was stuck in a mostly all-boys institute, her being the only female, it was difficult not falling for at least one of them, or at the very least, being attracted to one of them stupid teenage hormones. Waiting for all the smoke to die out from the impact of the crater, she looked towards Professor Xavier, his eyes set forward, a serious glint within them. Walking up to him, she asked, so prof, any idea what may be inside of it? The professor simply shook his head and replied, that I do not know, it seems that whatever may be lying within that crater has an almost unbelievable amount of mental fortitude, so much so that even I could not pierce through their defenses with my own telepathy, prepare yourself in the event that the entity within that crater is not as friendly as they may seem. Dean's jaw locked at that statement, how the hell was that possible? 
bar a few exceptions, the professor's ability with his telepathy was so strong even she was hard pressed to defend against his mental onslaught. Seeing Charles' gesture towards Hank brought her mind back into the situation, it seems like they would finally be heading down the crater. Preparing herself as best she could, she also headed down the crater, careful not to trip over any upturned dirt or debris. What all three found was not what they expected. Within that crater lay a body male it seemed like, covered in a ruined cloak, that, were it not for the extensive damage, Wolven shrouded his entire body within, and his face was covered by a strange mix of a wooden and porcelain mask, depicting the shape of a demon. Yes, indeed it was. The mask roughly looked to be the depictions of the Japanese demons of old, and only if their memory served them correctly. However, it didn't look like any stereotypical oni they've ever seen, sure, the signs of it being an oni were there, the horns, eyes, tusks, but that was where the similarities ended, it was a warm hue of sky and ocean blue, with there being two sets of bottom canines, while only one set of top canines were present, all three however were protruding quite sharply from the mouth of the mask. Then there were the tusks protruding out the sides of its mouth, a strange almost ethereal mist coiling around it, much like a lover's embrace, if one were to look closer, the mist seemed to align to the breathing pattern of the person wearing it. Intriguing. The top off the look, the largest set of horns were set on top of the mask, its edges gleaming in the mid-afternoon sun. The strangest part of the mask were the eyes however a trio of closed pupils, their color unknown to anyone but the owner of the mask, it was incredibly perplexing to see, but nevertheless, more important thoughts invaded the mind of the three individuals observing the body for any telltale signs of life. What they could see however was that the young man was in no healthy condition, multiple lacerations, puncture wounds, singe marks, bruises, my goodness was that a missing arm. What in the world? Jean and Hank had to look away lest they throw up at the gruesome sight, the professor however used to such sights, merely grimaced and softly requested his students to carefully extract the boy and carry him into the medical room. Charles could only sigh and wheel himself back to the edge of the crater, sending a telepathic request for Jay to slowly wheel him back up, he didn't expect this, not at all. He only hoped he was making the right decision by taking the boy in and healing his wounds, only time may tell what he may do regardless of their generosity, Charles had positive hopes for the coexistence of human and mutants, but that did not ensure he had high hopes for all mutants to coexist peacefully together. Much like he did not expect the companionship between humans and mutants to be all sunshine and flowers. Invictus Spiritus. Id. Kid. A harsh but warm voice shoots Naruto up from the land of bliss. Rubbing his eyes to get the fatigue out, Naruto was met face to face with his longtime companion and tenant, Kurama, known also as the Kyubi no Kitsune. Kurama. Buddy. What the hell happened? All I remember is that fight with Kagaya and sealing her, speaking of sealing her, are we dead? I was sure she got me with her all killing ash bones during the last few moments. Kurama huffed, his reply sounding just as unsure as he was, I don't really know kid, I thought we were goners for sure but the titanic tailed beast sighed, I have little to no clue as to how we're both alive and kicking, not to mention, if Kagaya didn't kill us, I was absolutely sure our fight between her and the Shinju would spell death for us, I don't know kid, but something seems really off. Naruto rubbed a hand through his hair in frustration and felt lost, so what the hell do we do now? Where are we in fact? Luckily for you, we're still in your mindscape, unluckily however you seem to have landed us in another sticky situation. Oh uh, what? Focus you idiot. Can't you feel it? Or rather, do you not feel that? Chakra is non-existent here. Wherever your Dumbas seems to have landed, we're definitely not in Kanoha anymore or the elemental nations for that matter, Kurama barked at his container, aggravated at his oblivious nature, Yao'd think after going through an entire war that you were essentially single-handedly known for stopping. Yao'd mature. Nope, not this bonehead. Crossing his legs and bumping his fists together in a meditative pose, Naruto submerged himself deeper into his own spiritual energies and reached out to feel if Kurama's statements held truth. Feel the energy of the world go through you, allow yourself to be encompassed in it, caressed by it, do not fear it, do not abhor it, do not scorn it, let nature and her kin guide you and empower you. There. Well natural energy came in spades, the feeling of chakra, or rather the lack of it was what drove him to stiffen in shock. The fuzzy bastard was right damn. Oddly enough, he could feel a presence watching over him, or rather, watching him to see if he would abuse the very fabric of mother nature and her power. Naruto snorted, like hell he would, like everything that came into his life, he would never allow himself to take any of it for granted, and he made sure to let the presence know it, he may be basking himself in natural energy, but he would never take more than what he needed, he refused to let greed overcome his sense of righteousness. After declaring it, albeit to himself, he could feel a strong and comforting presence wash over him like a blanket, it seemed whomever was watching over him was pleased with his response, and he allowed a satisfactory grin to grace his features. Thanks whoever you are. 
It'll be sure to never abuse this gift you have given me, it's a promise, Dadabeo. Naruto shouted out within himself, unsure as to why he did it, but felt like it was appropriate given the circumstances. The grunt from Kurama shook him out of his meditation, I don't want to be a bother kid actually, I am going to be a bother, and if you've got an issue with that, kindly go fuck yourself, coughing to regain focus on the topic at hand, we've got a situation on our hands kid, wake up and prepare yourself for a fight if needed. It'll pump you with some of my chakra in case you need to pull out some stops to get away. Nodding at his best friend and sending him a fist bump which was gratefully reciprocated, Naruto willed himself to wake up, allowing the real world to align his spiritual consciousness with his physical body. And with a fell swoop, he allowed himself to awaken. Invictus Spiritus. After taking the heavily injured man with them to the medical facility, Jean and Hank made sure that the medical equipment was properly set up and that the young man was given the necessary treatment in order to make a full recovery. After half an hour, they pulled up a chair and allowed themselves a moment of rest, regardless of the time it took to set it up, they both admitted to themselves that today was definitely not expected. Dini, my dear, do you reckon the young man will make a full recovery? I may even allow myself to safely estimate that he is right around our age, perhaps a bit older, his physiology certainly dictates him to be a young man in fact, he could be deemed as a superhuman with those traits of his, enhanced cell, tissue and muscle regeneration. An incredibly dense and compact bone structure which makes me think that wherever Hess from, it certainly isn't from Earth, at least not ours his skeletal structure is three times as thick, but maintains the same mass as our own, he may even be born from a world so much like our own, but with a heavier gravitational field than our own planets. It would certainly explain that unusual phenomena Hank asked her the question only to go on a scientific ramble that flew straight over Jean's head. Putting a hand to signal him to stop, she replied, Okay Hank, first of all, I need you to relax all that scientific mumbo jumbo, I don't speak nerd, and frankly don't think I ever will, however. I will agree with you in saying that the guy looks to be around our age, at least, his gene paused for a moment, a slight hint of scarlet dusting her cheeks, as she was about to admit an embarrassing detail she hoped would never get out. While setting the guy down onto the bed, they had to remove his articles of clothing, and she allowed herself a sneak peek in my goodness. The guy had one hell of a body, sweet merciful heaven luckily, Hank was too busy in his thoughts to see the embarrassment on her features, and she quickly got back into her statement. Anyways, as I was saying, the guy certainly looks young, there is not an ounce of body fat on him, and you felt how heavy he was right. The dude must be packing some serious muscle cause theirs, absolutely no freaking way the dude weighs that much with that little body fat. Hank nodded in agreement, indeed, it would seem to me that his body type came from a lifelong regime of proper exercise, perhaps even training and the right amount of each food group, it doesn't seem to be too bulky or uneven, and I would hazard a guess to say that all that muscle wasn't gained through the use of machines or through a gym, but rather through physical activity. Perhaps he played a sport of some sort. Basketball and football seemed to be the most likely of choices, seeing as both his upper and lower body received an equal amount of attention once again, Hank rambled on, but Jean understood all of it, as it didn't include any technical science jargon. Do you reckon he was in the military? I don't know about you, and I'd rather not pull what the professor did and try to peek into his mind, although admittedly, that didn't work out for him, so it certainly would be out of my own abilities Jean grumbled, though not angrily, but she continued on he just seems to scream military, or at the very least he was military trained, the dude's got this. You know or around him, you don't even need to be a telepath to get that much. Hank once again nodded in agreement, yes, yes, that would be a good guess, in fact, I would say that assumption won't be too far off the mark, at the moment, he is unconscious, but something about him just seems out of place, even him unable to properly word it, and I have a large vocabulary. This is frustratingly intriguing and if I could, I would wake him up now. Hank ruffled his hair in exasperation, the man being treated was a scientific wonder, and if the professor could give him express permission along with the test subject himself of course, he would definitely run the man through some tests. The hissing of the automatic door greeted the two of them to Xavier's smiling face, and as his eyes roamed toward the figure laying on the bed, the smile never left his face, although his eyes did slightly harden. Hello there, Jean, Hank, how goes the recovery of our patient? Charles asked softly, his worries for the unconscious figure overpowering his need for answers. As much as had liked to, his nature as a compassionate individual took precedence over his curiosity, and this young man's recovery was near the top of his priority list. Hank stood up and walked over to the machines monitoring his progress, well professor, as you can see, his recovery seems to be going along well however, it would seem to me that these machines are unnecessary as his breathing has evened out, and no signs of damage are now present on his features, although, I am unsure to the state of his body. I am sure that the boy will wake up in a few moments wait. 
With a start, he realized a figure on the bed started to shift and groan, and with a deep breath which caused the mist around his mask to grow larger, the eyes on the figure's mask opened, and a trio of burning amethyst eyes greeted them. Okay then that's not creepy at all Jean shuddered as she stared at the mask, its pupils now fully open and scanning the environment, it seemed like her guess was right, the fog surrounding his tusks were fitted to his breathing pattern, and the eyes on his mask were fitted to his own, creepy as it was. She had to give props to whoever created the mask because it must taken them one hell of a time in figuring out how to achieve such a thing. Invictus Spiritus. When Naruto woke, he didn't expect himself to be surrounded by a bald guy in a wheelchair, a man who had the stature and mannerisms of a beast, and a cute retreat further away. But her hair is beautiful, he complimented her looks, not realizing his thoughts projected outward, and was said as his eyes pinned directly at her, causing a flush of scarlet to bloom from her face, and for her to squirm minutely, whether it was from embarrassment or gratitude, had yet to figure out. Although, there was an indiscernible note of confusion that lit up in her eyes, as if she didn't exactly know what he said, but the way he stared at her and his inflection made it easy for her to connect the dots. Quickly moving his hand towards his face, he sighed in relief as he could feel the rounded grooves of the wood and smooth edges of the porcelain of his mask set firmly on his face, it was a gift from the Kanoha Eleven to commemorate the entirety of the allied shinobi nations, declaring him as the supreme commander. He had to admit, well he never got to be Hokage, being the supreme commander of what essentially equated to all the major hidden villages sure as hell came in a close second, and he had to admit under severe torture and Raymond shortage that having the title of supreme commander of the allied shinobi nation sounded a lot cooler than just Hokage. Still, being Hokage was his lifelong dream, he just became something else related to it. Still awesome though. Dealing a triplet of eyes still continue stare at him, he could only feel his confusion mounting. Ah uh, Karama, not trying to be snippy or anything but why are there people, why am I hooked up to a machine, and why are they looking at me? Naruto asked owlishly. Inwardly, he could feel his companion smack his head against the floor of his mindscape, okay moron, I'll put it simply in case you forgot our conversation just a few minutes ago, I don't have a clue either, so, unless you're willing to look like a deer caught in some flash of bright lights, you're going to prepare yourself for a fight. We're still recovering from that ass whooping we gave and got from Kagaya, so I can only give you enough to preform 3s ranks and a few air ranks, depending on what you pull off, watch yourself kid, these guys there is something weird about their energy signatures, I can't put my finger on it, because it's definitely not chakra, whatever it is, watch yourself kid. His countenance slipping into something more professional, preparing himself for an encounter, should the individuals find themselves to be on the more hostile side of negotiations, should he say. However, he had his doubts, why bother patching him up and leaving it at that? From what he could feel, his chakra hadn't been suspended, though that could do with their lack of chakra, and instead of something else as replacement, and he was confident that if he were to look down towards his body, he'd still find his seals in fully working condition, heck, why bother looking after him at all? Or had hardened him somewhat and turned him into a pseudo-cynic, but he didn't command 500,000 men and women under the same banner with that attitude, he could definitely attest it to his indomitable will and charisma or at least, that's what everyone else says. He never could understand why they would allow a 16-year-old to command them, but those details were in the past and belonged there, best not linger on those sorts of thoughts now. Dealing the looks from the three other individuals still in the room with him, he faced towards the perceived leader of the three. It wasn't that difficult to figure out that the bald-headed weirdo in the wheelchair was their leader, the other two individuals positioned themselves just in front and towards the back of him, allowing them to react quickly, should he lash out and attempt to restrain him, before he could even think about touching the dude. Luckily for them, he wasn't that type of guy. If they started bringing out weapons, however. Oh, then somebody's going to go home in a casket and it sure as hell won't be him. Clearing his throat to gain their attention which in and of itself wasn't too difficult a feat to achieve seeing as their eyes were already on him, he regarded them with curiosity, his mask unable to hide the rather blatant emotion from showing. Who are you and where am I? He thought he'd get straight to the brunt of it, seeing as they didn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon. Invictus Spiritus. While Hank, Charles and Jean were expecting a lot of things to come out of his mouth the moment the figure in the bed awoke, they didn't expect him to be Japanese of all things. Anata wa deredesu ka? Watashi wa dokadesu ka? Jean groaned, oh great. The first thing he says is something none of us can understand, damn it, I would've laughed at the situation if it happened to anyone but me. Hank sighed and could only rub his chin in exasperation, already thinking of ways they could pass for conversation at least eligible enough to allow their patient to understand that they were friendly and did not mean him harm. Charles Xavier only sat in his wheelchair and contemplated, his eyebrows furrowing in seriousness. It looks like we've hit quite a predicament, my oh my he could only think, if only. Ah yes, that may work. 
Hank, if I may Charles began, piquing Hank's interest and pulling him out of his indulgent thoughts. Yes, Professor. What is it? I may have a solution to our linguistic problem, I shall require your assistance however. Hank turned towards the professor and looked at him dead on, of course. What would you need of me? Charles could only hope that this would work. Well, he began and laid out his idea to Hank whose eyes shot open in surprise and eagerness the more he heard the professor speak. I think that even with all this technology, people still find cruel ways to kill, Naruto. With their conversation concluded, Naruto saw the man with a bulking stature turn towards him, already beginning to speak. Naruto however, decided to see if there was any other way of communication, because not understanding what they were saying sucked. Reaching out to his companion, he intoned curiously, Oi Fuzzbit, is there any other way we can understand them? Cause right now, all I'm hearing come out their mouths is gibberish, it sounds stupid. Hirama snorted, kid, if I knew, I won't be sitting here twiddling with my thumbs up my ass, ignoring his warden's disgusted gag, he continued whatever it is, I'm already getting bored at just sitting around doing nothing. The hour not the only one, Naruto sighed, already feeling the effects of sitting around and doing nothing, he really didn't care what it was they wanted, he just needed to stretch his legs, he could feel them cramping up, and that seriously wasn't a good sign. Ah, don't be such a baby, Yaob sat through worse, Kurama intoned, feeling the aggravation leak from his host, besides, don't you know sign language? And don't say you don't, because I'm sure as hell that scarecrow taught you. Yeah, but that's Anbu sign language, I'm pretty sure they can't be applied here, Naruto rolled his eyes at Kurama's ignorance. Think for just a second kid, just a second what's the difference between normal sign language and Anbu sign language? Kurama began slowly, as if he was speaking with a particularly dim child, which in this case was replaced by a blithering adult he shamefully called his container. Well, besides a few key differences in structure and execution, they're practically the same oh it finally clicked for Naruto, whose mind finally worked well enough to piece the puzzle together, but how will I know they'll understand me and not take offense in case our interpretations of the signs are different? Hirama shrugged, better than nothing, what do you think? It sure beats looking like a brain dead monkey, oh wait, you always do, swiftly ignoring Naruto's grunt of go fuck yourself. Deciding that he had nothing to lose, Naruto held his hands up, causing the three to tense, thinking he was about to attack them. Geez, laid off with the paranoia why don't you? Naruto rolled his eyes at their apparent stiffness, they would suck at being shinobi. He digressed however, he was much the same when he was younger. Slowly making motions with his hands, he signed out a greeting towards the three, hoping that at least one of them might understand, judging by the slight widening and surprise in the larger man's eyes, he garnered that he understood the gist of what he was saying. Good, it made communication easier until they could properly speak. Hi there, thanks for saving me, was what he signed, and judging by the other man's motions, he could just barely make out his own greeting. Hank looked towards the blonde whose hands were now in the motion he was actually familiar with, and he quickly gestured to the professor to let him sign, seeing as he studied up on the language in the event the professor ever took in a deaf student into their institute. Signing back a greeting to the blonde's own, he was ecstatic that they were finally making progress. Hello there, it's our pleasure, what's your name? The blonde cleared his throat and bowed his head, and Hank knew he understood him. Yuzumaki Naruto, Hajimemashite. Jean, Hank and Charles finally understood, the man was Japanese. Although, it seemed more archaic than the modern language that they knew of, maybe he was from an isolated village. Even if he was, why would he be in a crater? And how would he have survived if he was a normal human being? Could he possess the ex-Jean? Was he a possible mutant? All these questions burned through their minds, but Hank decided to grace Naruto with a response seeing as he nearly forgot to. Ah. Apologies, I'm Hank McCoy, this is Professor Charles Xavier, and the lady behind me is Jean Grey, Hank gestured towards himself, then the professor, then Jean allowing Naruto to soak in their names and understand who they were. Naruto nodded and attempted to pronounce their names. H. Hanku McCoy. Chiresu Xavier. Jean Guri. Due to his native Japanese heritage, Hank could tell that he would have troubles with their names for a while, at least, until he could pick English up proficiently enough to converse. Hank didn't let it deter him and nodded towards Naruto, signing his praise at being able to closely say their names for the first time. Their pronunciation needs a little work, but it'll do, do you mind answering some questions for us? Hank signed, hoping he wasn't being too rude by getting into the heart of the matter. Naruto signed back, yes, but is there an easier way to talk? I'm not very good with sign. Hank nodded in understanding and signed back, if you come with me to my lab, I can try and hook you up with a translator. Translator? What? The three could tell that he was obviously confused by Hank's statement. Hank quickly clarified, it's a way of letting us talk without the use of our hands. Naruto understood, an expression of clarity forming behind his mask, that makes sense, will I be detained? 
No, not really, seeing as you haven't done anything to make us detain you in the first place. Finally, they were getting somewhere. Invictus Spiritus. Naruto internally sighed in relief, now things were getting there, they were still no closer to fully understanding each other, but it was a good first step. Well. Kurama began, his tone taking on a superior edge. Naruto raised a brow, well what? Him waiting he hummed gleefully, waiting for Naruto to connect the dots. Naruto rolled his eyes, finally understanding what the bastard wanted, alright fine, thank you oh so much Kurama, your wisdom and intellect know no bounds, I bow before you in all my stupid glory. The FFFFT, Kurama snorted, that was pathetic, but ill accepted, shows how graceful of a tenant I can be, no. His sentence ending in an insufferable smirk. Yeah, yeah, soak it up you killer rabbit, this is the last time I do something like that. Aha, uh -huh, sure. Ignoring his tenant's comment, Naruto looked for his equipment, seeing it stacked neatly on top of a desk sat right by his bed, it wasn't much, just his headband, his equipment pouches, his now clean and kempt clothes, ha, huh, that's weird, did they fix it or something? And a few odds and ends that he always had on him. Ugh, as much as I like the progress we're making when it comes to this language barrier, I hope the big guy can actually provide a solution, Naruto intoned annoyingly, feeling bummed out at the fact that he couldn't properly speak with them. The voice that certainly wasn't Kurama's breached through his thoughts, perhaps I can help, and before he could reject whatever it was that mysterious voice alluded to, he could feel something pour through his body, his head now being assaulted with images of characters, letters, and strokes of all different sizes and shapes. What the fuck was that? Oi, Kurama, did you hear that voice? Rubbing his throbbing temple in an attempt to soothe the migraine that was coming on, he reached out to the furball, hoping he didn't just hallucinate that voice. Kid. Kid what the hell happened? I cold contact you for a second, something was blocking my ability to reach out to you. Ugh, not so loud buddy, my head still splitting from that migraine I just got, Naruto groaned in discomfort, and his companion's word sunk in, wait, are you saying you cold and hear the weird voice that just came through my head? No, I felt a disturbance in the mindscape, but from what I could tell, nothing was touched, and the only difference is that a new segment in your mind appeared, you mind filling me in. Well fears not much to say, I was complaining about not being able to understand them, and suddenly this voice just pops fuck out of nowhere, and before I knew it, something poured over me. Whatever it is kid, it doesn't seem to have affected your mental inhibitions too much, however, it'll look around again and try to pinpoint the source. Thanks buddy, Naruto gratefully said. Eh, of course. Shaking his head and looking forwards, he felt the concerned eyes of Hank, Jean, and Charles on him, seeing him wince and squirm like that was probably why they stepped forward to attempt to see if he was alright. He waved them off with a cheery grin, ma, ma. I'm alright, see? Just had a bit of a headache is all. The three suddenly leaned back, clear surprise etched on their features. Naruto looked at them curiously, his masked visage staring into them, what? Is there something on my face? The man, Hank, suddenly rubbed the bridge of his nose and looked towards the blonde, well, just a few moments ago, we couldn't understand you at all, and now suddenly, you can speak our language so fluently it have mistaken you for a local. Naruto blinked in surprise, did that weird voice give him the ability to understand them? Holy shit. Whoa I can understand you guys now. And judging from your reactions, so can you. The wheelchair-bound man the professor Hank introduced him as rolled himself forward, well, yes young man, we can understand you, well this is certainly a surprise, it's a welcome one for sure. Naruto just chuckled awkwardly and rubbed the back of his neck, well sorry about that, my brains were scrambled for a bit. Charles nodded, well, it's no surprise, you did crash into our backfield in a meteor of course. Naruto stiffened and looked at Charles disbelievingly, wait what I crash landed in a meteor yower, kidding me old man. Tuckling, Charles merely shook his head, oh no, I am most definitely not kidding, you can see for yourself, with that, he turned around and rolled towards the exit, looking back just as the doors opened, and gesturing for the three of them to follow him. Come on then, it'll be sure to have Bobby and Scott know that you're up and running, with his piece said, he rolled away, likely heading to the side of the crash. Naruto grumbled, talking to me as if him a goddamn robot, the nerve of that gramps. Hank merely chuckled, and Jean giggled into her hand and were heading out the medical room, but not before turning back and gesturing Naruto to suit back up in his clothing. I hope you don't mind, but I took the liberty of restoring what I could of your clothing, seeing as you arrived in nothing but your tattered hood, mask, and ruined clothes. He thanked Hank in appreciation and lifted himself off from the bed, letting his feet touch the cold surface of the room floor, grabbing all his items and quickly dressing up, he double-checked himself to ensure he had all his equipment and paraphernalia on him before heading out and following Hank and Jean, who were waiting just by the entrance of the medical room. Nodding towards them, he allowed them to lead him towards where Crash landed and hopefully find some answers. Invictus Spiritus.
Stepping out into the large forested area that the mansion was surrounded by, Naruto could see that in the center, what walled been a largely untouched open field surrounded by trees, was now a smoking hot crater, dirt and debris littered all around. Naruto looked sheepish as he approached the group, now with two additional members Bobby and Scott, if he recalled what the professor said. While the thought of crashing here didn't bother him, it was the large gaping hole in the middle of the field that did, he didn't realize had make such an impact. Just how fast was he going for the crater to be this deep and wide? Matter of fact, how did they stop it? Kurama did say they had some weird energy signatures. Feeling Hank and Jean walk up to him, he heard Jean say if you are wondering how we managed to stop that meteor from making a massive gape in the institute, you are going to have to ask the professor, I'm not really allowed to give you more than that, all I can say is that you owe me blondie. He nodded slowly, and what would that be? Jean tapped her chin and thought, I actually haven't thought of something substantial, but I will soon. Hank simply gestured for Naruto to follow him, come Naruto, the professor wants to see you. Shrugging, he allowed Hank and Jean to guide him to where the professor was sat in his wheelchair, and before any of them could greet him, he turned around and smiled. Hello there Naruto, how are you feeling? He asked, the tone in his voice genuinely curious of his well-being. As Naruto reached up to scratch the back of his neck, he was reminded of one morbid detail. His right arm was completely removed from the elbow down, while it certainly will impede his ability to fight, until he could get acclimated to fighting without it, he was just happy he was still kicking. It's the thought that matters, getting his mind back on track, he answered the professor, I'm good old man, thanks, I'm a tough guy you know. With a proud grin, he tapped his chest with a closed fist. Smiling, Charles gestured all of them to look towards the crater, specifically Naruto seeing as he was the one that caused it, as you can see, due to Charles paused momentarily, a slight lull in his thoughts that Naruto caught on, special circumstances, we were able to divert the course of the meteor and have it crash into the back of the mansion, instead of destroying parts of it. Stroking his chin in wonder, Naruto let his thoughts be known, that's impressive, did you guys manage to stop this all by yourself? Yes however, if it weren't for young Jean and Bobby's quick and decisive actions, it may have caused more destruction than it has, and may have even potentially put you in a worse off state than in the one we found you in. That last statement had Naruto curious, well he did amass quite the collection of injuries, some fatal and others too minor to even bother remembering, he was wondering just how bad his state was considering the massive crater the meteor that was housing him made. He let his curiosity be known, how bad was my condition. Charles grimaced, to put it simply, none of the students here would been able to stomach the sight of your condition, I don't know what occurred that caused you to have those sorts of injuries in the first place, but the fact that you are still alive and a majority of those injuries are now fully healed, it would appear that you are quite special, if I may. Were there any circumstances in your life that may have caused this sort of healing factor to appear? Naruto paused, unsure if he should divulge any information about him that may potentially be used against him, deciding to have faith in the old man, he slowly began, telling you every single detail of the unique circumstances that brought me here, would take too long to explain so he'll try and size it down a bit. Sighing wistfully into the air above, Naruto began his tale, it's safe to say, I'm not from this world, or rather, I'm not from this plane of existence or even reality, where I come from, all of those who are born have the ability to conjure up a source of energy that we call chakra, chakra, in our own definition. It is the combination of physical and spiritual energy, and makes up as a base for all of our power, of course, not all of us would been able to do it, but it didn't mean it was non-essential to those who were lacking when it came to their chakra pool, Naruto knelt down and began etching into the grass with a thin blade of wind. For example, those who didn't have the necessary pools of chakra to call upon became civilians, but all of us needed chakra to survive, this source of energy is produced within these thin lines that are spread out within the body, and the largest collection of said energy resides within the belly, and throughout said lines, lay nodes from which chakra can be released from within us. They're called chakra points. Before he could continue, he was interrupted by Hank's inquiry, so, one could only release this energy throughout these various nodes correct? But guess, and you are mostly right, experienced shinobi like myself who have the technique and the amounts of energy needed, are able to expel our techniques from any part of our pathway system, some of us are even able to forcefully expel a large amount of it throughout our entire body, in order to break through certain illusions or even physical binds, however. That requires an incredibly large amount of energy, and to date, only me and a few other individuals were ever able to do this without exhausting our supply of chakra, ignoring the curious murmur of, shinobi like the ninjas from Japan. He continued, if you are able to locate or memorize the locations of all 361 chakra points throughout our system and hit them with a specific amount of pressure and force, you could essentially seal their ability to release chakra throughout their entire body and thus preventing them from using any techniques that require the usage of chakra itself. 
It seemed like Hank was the only one willing to question him, which he found to be amusing, so what would happen if you did seal all of their chakra points? Would they lose the ability to perform techniques? Yes and no, well they would lose the ability to perform techniques, it won't be permanent, as you would have to forcefully destroy the individual's chakra system in order to prevent them from ever regaining the ability to use it without dying, so, well they would lose the ability to use their chakra, it won't be permanent. Judging from your extensive knowledge, it seems like you know of people, perhaps even personally, that were able to locate these chakra points and seal them off. He smirked at Hank's perceptiveness, correct, my village held a clan that were able to use an ocular bloodline that granted them the usage of observing the flow of chakra within an opponent's body, and with deadly accuracy, would pinpoint and shut off any specific chakra point to disable them from moving and using techniques, not only were they very skilled at hand-to-hand -hand combat. Combined with their physical and spiritual prowess, a majority of their opponents would never seek to directly combat them. You say you were a shinobi and that you belong to a village, just how many shinobi are there? Jean was the one to ask the question this time around, her curiosity having finished its peak and her ability to keep quiet fading. Naruto cold and keep the despondent look on his face from being hidden, there were tens of thousands of us, now. I'm not so sure, thousands maybe. Perhaps even hundreds, a majority of us died in a global conflict that nearly wiped out the entirety of the shinobi populace and did wipe out the civilian ones, to get more context, he'll explain the system we used to have. He began drawing once again on the grass, using this time to draw out the various kanji for fire, water, earth, lightning and wind, along with other symbols such as tea, spring, river, and so on. We used to be split into five major villages and numerous smaller ones, governed by a leader called a cage, or shadow in your language, and he was governed by a daimyo, who would essentially act as the leader of the entire major village, the daimyo controlled the flow of income, supply, manpower, and so forth, but we shinobi were the ones to go out and get it. You could say that the cage was the middleman between us and the daimyo, but the cage do have a lot of political power, and those who were worthy had to be both physically and mentally ready to bear such a burden, there is not much else I can say about the various governing bodies as I was never familiar with politics, he paused to take a breath, this was much harder than he expected. He didn't truly realize the complexities his world had until he was forced to explain it to people unfamiliar with it. Regaining his breath, he continued, now comes the village and who inhabits it, if we were to split it up into a percentage, my village would be a rough split of 70-30, 70% of our village population were inhabited by shinobi, this also includes those in training and those in retirement, while the other 30% would be the civilian population. These guys would be responsible for everything essential to the daily life of the shinobi, cooking, trading, commerce, crafting, you name it, the civilians would handle it, if you were looking for something more specific or of a higher quality than most civilian shops contained, you'd go into the part of the village where most retired shinobi live and set up shop. Depending on who you asked and what you needed, there would be a shinobi who could cater to your specific needs, of course, not all of the shinobi who cater to these needs are retired, but most are, need a specific vial of poison needed for an infiltration and interrogation mission. Our interrogation and herbalist specialist can hook you up, need high quality chakra conducting weapons. The Higurashi, one, family could set you up. Each village had everything they needed in order to produce what they wanted, of course, some villages had a surplus of resources that they would trade in exchange for others that their land may not have a large supply of, and this is where a majority of the civilian populace would put their stock into, trade and commerce, as that was the most financially lucrative business opportunity for them. Stopping a moment to regain his breath, he allowed another few moments to pass in case anyone had any questions, about to continue, he heard the professor speak up. The world you lived in bears some similarities to ours in terms of military power and politics, I am curious of one thing though, do the shinobi from your lands only fight when necessary? Say for example, in the event of war or an invasion. Naruto smiled sadly at that, I was just about to explain that, however, I need to make sure you guys know the major villages before continuing onwards, with this, he began pointing towards the symbol for earth, fire, water, lightning and wind, these were the five major villages, Iwagakur are the village hidden in stone, that resided in their country in the land of earth, Sunagakur. The village hidden by sand, residing in the land of wind, Kurigakur, the village hidden in the mist, residing in the land of water, Kumagakur, the village hidden in the clouds, residing in the land of lightning. Finally, Thiras Kanahagakur, the village hidden in the leaves, residing in the land of fire, this was the village I was born and raised in, the reason why shinobi existed was because they were to act as both the military and its main driving economic force, if a minor village needed a task to be done that couldn't be achieved with their own population. They would hire the nearby major village, and in turn, the village would send out a group of shinobi, and depending on what the mission was, they would send a force suitable for the task. 
For example, if you needed to move large stocks of inventory, the respective cage would send out a group of genin to do the work, as they were relatively new and needed both the experience and the training, an escort mission from the land of fire to the land of waterfall. The cage would send a team of genin overseen by either a chunin or jonin, assassination. Depending on who the high-value target was and where they were located, the cage would either send a lone jonin or perhaps even a solo anbu member or team of them. Jean was so very confused, ah what? You mind explaining what those terms mean? What's a genin, or anbu, or whatever else? He could hear Karama growl frustratingly in the back of his head, irritating monkeys, no wonder I tried wiping your kind out multiple times, Naruto bit back, and each time you got sealed, so, zip your lip fuzzy, ignoring his companion's haughty huff, he began to explain in simpler terms, he realized that this would take much longer to explain than anticipated, and by the looks of it. The sun was well on its way to setting, and they all needed to get a bit of rest. Essentially, the hierarchy of the village would be split into seven groups, eight with an exception, you had the civilians, who were at the bottom of the hierarchy, but were essential for keeping the village up and running with their physical labor and economic value, then you had academy students, who were potential shinobi in training, who would then have the opportunity to graduate and become a genin. After passing a few tests and proving themselves to their teacher, you would then be entered into a global examination event called the Junin exams, where the exam would be split up into multiple categories, and it would end with a final tournament where the potential Junin who passed their preliminary categories and fights could graduate and become said Junin. You would then have the ability to ask for a promotion to Jonin, however, these were done locally and much more under the radar, as Jonin were the elite driving force of any nation. However, if you wanted to go a step beyond that, there was the Anbu, now these guys were the cream of the crop, specially selected, trained and reviewed, they did all the black ops missions, assassinations, blackmail, sabotage, espionage, you name it, they did it, my village was especially well known for producing multiple Anbu members well before their adulthood, I would know. My teacher and best friend's brother were both Anbu by the time they hit their pre-teens, then lastly, you have the cage, I don't know much detail about this specific group, as the way they would elect a potential leader of super-powered shinobi, were kept highly under wraps, and would only be discussed and agreed upon, if the daimyo also agrees with the decision. Balai only named seven groups, the eighth group is an exception as they were called special jonins, so, while they weren't actual jonin per se, a majority of these guys had the physical and mental ability to promote to jonin, but due to a lack of experience or otherwise, they were held back from doing so, in layman terms, we were mercenaries, highly trained, highly efficient, and extremely deadly. With that, Naruto fell on his butt with an exasperated huff and looked towards the darkened night. Maybe it was just him, but that took way longer than it needed to, who knew had be going on a long tangent so soon after his awakening. Talk about his odd luck. Charles Xavier could only rub his temples and sigh, this is quite the situation, so, not only do we have a potential super-powered assassin in our hands, but if I were to trust Naruto's words, his world birthed these types of beings, what kind of history did they have to be given such a morbid life? One can only hope he is the only one to be sent here, I shudder to think of the consequences if there were another one, and he was much more antagonizing than our blonde here. While Charles pondered on the situation at hand, Jean, Bobby, Hank and the others could only gawk and lay flabbergasted. Wait so, this guy has an actual ninja Bobby shouted with excitement, causing Jean to smack him in the back of the head and Scott to scold him. Bobby. Do you know how dangerous he could be? Did you not hear him? His people were mercenaries. Meaning, if someone evil like Magneto were to tempt him with something we cold possibly give, who's to say he won't switch sides? Scott's response was grim, much like his usual self. Yes, but if he were truly an evil person at heart, do you not think he would have the ability to kill us all before we could even react? Let's be realistic for a moment, none of us have the experience that he does, he was born for that life for crying out loud. Do you not think that he would've just gone and offed us if he wanted to? Jean was exasperated at his paranoia, sure he was cute, but lord above, was he such a stickler. Hank agreed with Jean's assessment, well I would put it in a nicer way, I can't help but agree with Jean's assessment here, none of us have the abilities nor the prowess to defend against someone like him, we barely have a grasp of our own powers as it is, and even if we had the professor on our side, it won't matter because he won't be able to do much except slow him down. Let's not rush to conclusions here Summers. Scott grunted and acquiesced his opinion begrudgingly, what they didn't realize however was the volume their discussion took, and that it piqued Naruto's interest enough to butt in and confirm their valid worries. I don't mean to be cruel, but I agree with Jean and Hank, if I did harbor any ill will towards all of you, none of you would be alive by the time either one of you blinked, to demonstrate his point, he blinked in front of Jean, causing her to yelp and nearly fall on her back, if it not were Naruto's hands catching onto her waist and back. Whoa. Sorry. I didn't mean to cause you that much of a fright, are you okay? 
His voice was genuinely worried, and his eyes pierced through Jean's own, causing her to turn as red as her hair. Wow, his hands are really big, and they're surprisingly gentle, I wonder, is he also she quickly killed that train of thought, before it could spiral further downwards, and have her more flustered than she already was, why yeah I'm okay, thanks, with a smooth movement, he lifted her straight back up and looked towards Scott and the others. Yeah, as I was saying, you guys would be dead before you knew it, but don't worry. He waved his hands in a placating and surrendering manner, I have no intentions of doing so, I don't even know why I would to be honest, you guys patched me up and treated me kindly, why would I repay that kindness by slaughtering you for no good reason? Well I do appreciate your kindness, please bear in mind that a majority of these students have been badly mistreated due to their gifts, Charles Xavier rolled up behind Scott, causing the student to stiffen and nearly fall, if he didn't manage to catch himself with a foot. Naruto rubbed his neck and grinned, yeah I get that, but don't sweat it. I'm more than happy to do anything you might need help with, whether it's physical labor or something more, I'll be glad to provide, just say the word. Charles merely chuckled, well that is appreciated lad, I believe it's time for us to bid the day farewell and head into the mansion, the sun's already set, and we've got a day ahead of us tomorrow, come, Hank, and I will lead you to a temporary room, until we find the time to fully settle you in, with that, he willed his wheelchair to turn around, and motioned both Hank and Naruto to follow him. The two following in sync once they've realized just how dark it was, the others, seeing both the professor and Hank lead the new kid into the mansion, followed suit the events in the day quickly catching up to them. Invictus Spiritus. But the trio of men, both Hank and Naruto, could be seen discussing the information that Naruto was kind enough to give them on his world, Hank's scientific mind overriding his sense of fatigue in favor of gaining more knowledge on an alternate dimension, so similar yet different like their own. So, what sort of technology did your world share with ours Naruto? Hank could be seen asking, a notepad in one hand, pen in the other, jotting down whatever notes he deemed were necessary to building up his library of information stored within his head. Naruto rubbed his chin contemplatively, the question being one of the simpler ones from the beast man, well, I'm not sure exactly what technology your world and mine shared, but I do know that we did have the same medical equipment that you guys do, albeit a less technologically advanced one, we also had TVs, radios, among other things, in terms of transport. Considering the only people to ever need to have a use for transport were the civilians, we did have horse-driven carriages, along with a steam-powered train, however, the train itself was an incredibly rare commodity, and the only one I ever saw was during my mission to the Land of Spring, which at the time was known as the Land of Snow, as far as I was aware. That train was the only one across the entire elemental nations. Hank continued jotting down notes, humming and nodding to each and every sentence Naruto would say, essentially, your world was a mixture of pre- and post-industrial age technologies, with some technologies being a rare occurrence, such as that train you were speaking of, did your people own firearms? All Hank received was an odd huh. And realizing Naruto may not know what firearms actually were decided to elaborate, ah. That's a no then, well, to put it simply, a firearm is a piece of equipment that would allow any person to fire a high-velocity round from a rifle with varying speeds, distances and stopping power. The blonde made a face of realization, is that so? Well, the only thing I could compare it to is the technology that the people from the land of the sky employed, well I don't believe they could achieve the same speeds that your firearms seem to be capable of, I'm sure that they were rudimentary ones at best, attached to their wrists and with a simple press. Would fire gas pressured kunai from said wrist mount, while well, they were fast, the more experienced shinobi were able to dodge it. Hank made a noise of curiosity, so are you saying that if I were to shoot a certain firearm at you, with a certain round, you or anyone who has an equal amount of experience, would be able to dodge it? He snorted, I'm not saying, I'm stating, one of the most prolific shinobi of my era, who funnily enough was my teacher and was the student of my father, made a technique that he dubbed the lightning cutter, simply because on the day he created the technique, he managed to cut a lightning bolt straight in half. Hank gaped, and Charles had to stop himself from repeating the same action as Hank, while there were mutants and superheroes who were capable of being even faster than lightning, it still came as a shock that a mere human with an innate energy system would be able to achieve the same things only mutants and superheroes villains were capable of. Hang on a minute, your teacher was able to not only react, but even cut through lightning, you do realize that the return stroke or the very bright visible flash that we see as lightning can travel upwards to 220 million miles per hour correct? That's one third the speed of light. Naruto looked at Hank oddly, huh, does it actually travel that fast? To answer your question, yes, yes, he can. And are you capable of imitating the same move? Hank's voice could be heard nearly dripping with scientific anticipation. Oh, the tests he could conduct with him. 
Naruto hummed thoughtfully, to be honest, some of my abilities allow me to boost my reaction time, along with my precognitive abilities to around about the speed of light, perhaps even faster, though I've never tested it, nor do I know enough about science to actually test it properly. Hank couldn't take it anymore, and with blinding speed, turned around and gripped Naruto's shoulders, a calculating gleam in his eyes, my boy, you and I will be great, and I mean great friends, would it be possible for me to borrow you and conduct some expert I mean, some field tests on your abilities? Sure, when? Naruto raised an eyebrow in the look at Hank's eyes, while nearly not on the same vein as Orochimaru's creepy glare whenever something caught his interest, or Crazy Snake Pito as he liked to dub him, it was quite disconcerting to see the same mad scientific gleam in Hank's eyes, albeit, it was on a more controlled and less batshit insane level. Charles coughed into his hand, realizing that they've stopped in the hallways for the better part of 10 minutes now, as much as I would enjoy listening to the rest of this conversation, I believe we should continue to lead Naruto here to his room, he must be quite exhausted from absorbing all these new things in one go. Hank blinked and let out an awkward chuckle, oh dear, my apologies professor, Naruto, I was too caught up in my fascination with his abilities that I didn't realize what today must felt like for him, he turned to look at Naruto, a genuine look of apology and sadness marring his features, I truly am sorry for the inconvenience Naruto. Naruto merely waved him off with a grin, it's no biggie Hank. You are not the first person I met that adored the subject of science, and I'm sure you won't be the last, your professor is right though, we should continue to my room, so you guys can start heading off to yours and taking a rest, especially you professor. I'm sure that you and Jean must completely burn yourselves out stopping the meteor from making a gaping hole in the mansion, did I ever say sorry for that? Charles merely laughed, that's no problem at all my boy. It isn't your fault that we encountered such a bizarre scenario today, and I believe this won't be the last time if you decide to stick around. Naruto merely snickered, his snickering showing off some canines due to how hard he was attempting not laughing outright, you got that right old man. Before the three knew it, they arrived at the temporary room that Naruto would be staying in, coincidentally, it was in between Hank's and Jean's own room, which would allow him to interact with the two people he was already familiar with, however, Naruto understood his own nature of wanting to make friends and resolved to meet the rest of the members in the mansion. Here you are Naruto, as you can already tell, I chose this room for you to settle in, as you would be able to reach out to both Hank or Jean, should you need anything, we'll continue the introductions for tomorrow, but for now, head in there and make yourself at home, I'll attempt to sort out the mess the meteor created, but until then, just rest up and enjoy the rest of your evening. Charles explained to the blonde, handing him a keycard that would allow him to enter and exit his room freely, along with showing him how to operate said keycard. But that being said, I'll head off to my room Naruto, I'll be seeing you tomorrow, so have a good evening, Professor, Naruto, with a cheery wave, Hank had swiped his own keycard and entered into his room, content to rest the contents of the day away, which left Naruto and the professor alone, the professor making sure he knew how to use the keycard and its keypad, should he ever lose that keycard. Alright professor, I think I've got the hang of this, thanks for taking the time to help settle me in and sorry again for the mess I caused Naruto chuckled awkwardly at that, his only remaining hand coming up to scratch at the back of his neck due to old habits. Charles merely chuckled and waved him off, that's quite alright, now go on and get some rest, we'll deal with all the other details tomorrow, Good night, Naruto, with a farewell, the professor wheeled himself around and continued down the hallway, most likely heading into his own room. Deciding to stop delaying the inevitable, Naruto swiped his keycard, and with a hiss of air, the door before him opened up and stepping inside, he realized just how big the room was, it was more reminiscent of a two or three bedroom apartment that he saw while doing some apartment hunting in Kanoha, with a comfortable dark oak floor contrasting the white. of slightly grey walls surrounding the room. In the middle of the room, hugging the back of the wall, was a large full double-sized Murphy bed, with a large cabinet supporting the frames of the bed itself, considering the amount of open space that the cabinet had, and the almost immaculate condition it was in, Naruto guessed that this room was only used once or twice before he was given it. That's a really nice bed, and the extra space means I can just stuff my non-essentials on there, not that I had much in the first place, you reckon the bed's comfier than the one we had at home Kurama? Naruto asked, relaying his observations to the tenant inside his belly. Ah, who cares? I never understood why you humans ever needed to invent these things, your ancestors slept on the floor like we did, why can't you? Kurama snorted derisively, his distaste for the human race showing. Let it be known, while Kurama trusted Naruto, it did not mean he trusted the rest of his race, in this case, his trust solely lay in Naruto, seeing as the tailed beast was stuck with him since his birth, he got to see just the type of person that the blonde was, it did not mean he held the humans in any lower standards however. 
understanding Naruto allowed the fearsome nine-tailed beast to realize that the human race was not solely made up of evil beings like Madara Kagaya, but of all kinds and backgrounds, from the morally corrupt Danzo to the morally ambiguous Itachi Ache. The kid soon knew that his hatred of humans would not continue on like this forever, not since his sealing within Naruto, but it surely didn't mean that the thousands upon thousands of years of resentment that he had built up since the passing of his father, Hagoromo, would pass within two decades of being stuck inside a human that proved him wrong. Because we're an evolved species Kurama, that's why we have the intellect, and you don't, his container bit back cheekily, if not a bit too readily, almost as if he expected this sort of comment from his companion. Oh fuck yourself. Always a pleasure conversing with you fuzzy. Deciding to leave his companion alone to stew in his mood swing, Naruto began to strip himself out of his clothes, however, realizing that he didn't have any sort of sleepwear, and the habit of sleeping with his boxers leaving him during the starting theaters of the war, after all, you won't want to be caught under attack while still clad in boxers, he decided to just strip himself of his top. Leaving his fishnet on and keep his trousers on, resolving to fix the issue of no sleepwear by tomorrow, Naruto flopped onto the bed, the soft cushioning of the mattress, instantly lulling him into a sense of sleep. Damn, from ending a war to stepping into an entirely unknown new world, guess things never do get old for us do they buddy? Naruto sounded out to Kurama, hoping his temper had abated somewhat during the last few minutes. You're damn right brat, I thought that loudmouth mother of yours got into all sorts of insane situations, from getting kidnapped by Kumo, to being nearly assassinated due to her status of being the sole heir of Yuzushi Agakur before its, quite honestly, sad downfall. But you just take the cake. Hey, you're right about that one, still, that just means we get to go on another wild adventure, right? His tailed companion snorted, even if I said no, I won't have a choice, seeing as wherever you go, I go too, just don't forget the shinobi code of conduct, what was it, rule number 01. The shinobi must adapt, overcome, and overpower any and all scenarios, Naruto stated, quoting off the first rule of the shinobi code of conduct, that all five cages had him remember and commit to memory too, in order to be effective on the battlefield. Good, looks like you haven't forgotten, don't forget shinobi code of conduct rule number 02. A shinobi must be aware at all times, to do the opposite is to invite death, Kurama gave him the second rule, making sure that his container knew and had it hardwired into that thick skull of his, that no matter what, he should never lose focus, especially now that they were stuck in a world. They knew next to nothing about, something here is all to make sure his container remedied immediately. Kid, I don't need to tell you, but I will anyways, we don't know what sort of enemies we might encounter, they might be even worse than Kagaya herself, I pray to Kami that's not the case, but we can never be too careful, we've stepped into new territory kid, so I don't need to remind you that one misstep could result in both of us dying, Kurama warned gravely. His tone not allowing any room for disagreement. Yeah, yeah, don't worry, you know I won't let my guard down, not anymore, Naruto grimaced at his last statement, knowing that if he didn't let his guard down last time, him and Kurama would still end up being in the elemental nations, and not here, wherever here was. Don't beat yourself up about it, it happens to the best of us, now let's get some rest Brad, it's been a long day, and I need to get some rest, my fur's beginning to chafe, oh, and what's our motto? Kurama knew his container would answer this before he headed off to the land of dreams, as was routine with the two of them every time they had this sort of conversation. Naruto could just feel the grin oozing off his furred companion's snout and grinned back, never back out, never give in, and never surrender. Heh, you still got that fire in you, alright kid, sleep well, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, night Kurama. And with the conclusion of their conversation, came the conclusion of the day, its events catching up to Naruto far faster than he had expected, the moment his eyes had closed, his mind had shut off and he was lulled into the sweet land of dreams, the final thought in his head being of the new shenanigans him and Kurama would get up to, and the new opponents that they'd get to fight. Thanks for watching.